I hate purity. I hate goodness. I don't want virtue to exist anywhere. I want everyone corrupt. On the 21st of December 1994, as a 19-year-old young man, I attended a seemingly random gig at the London Astoria by my favorite band, The Manic Street Preachers. The electrifying show was spectacular. The band trashed everything on stage with the act marking an end of an era. But the gig's significance only crystallized later. Guitarist and lyricist, the motto, the advocate of the band, Richie Edwards disappeared off the face of the earth shortly afterwards on the 1st of February 1995. It seemed that I caught the band right at that turning point. Needless to say here that I was a fan. I was mesmerized by the band since 1992, but this particular show, underlined later by Richie's disappearance, left a huge mark on me from then on, witnessing his last ever gig. Back in that December, in 1994, the band was promoting their current record, The Holy Bible. The album was released on the 30th of August the same year, and it undeniably remains Edwards' masterpiece. Even the cover art, titled Strategy, South Face, Front Face, North Face, by the then only 23-year-old artist, Jenny Seville, reflected its uncompromising, unflinching contents. We never heard anything like that before. Its genuine darkness was driven by heavy guitars and riffs. But it wasn't metal, it wasn't grunge, it wasn't really rock. It just stood out as a strange hybrid, a statement delivered coldly with stark, raw guitar sound, with condensed but razor-sharp lyrics that cut to the bone. It was like a coded message that needed to be cracked. It raised questions about anorexia, mass consumption, Nazi death camps, sex workers, and self-harm, reflecting Richie Edwards' state of mind at the time. The band have reached enormous success and higher chart positions later on, and in a way, Richie's absence set them free musically as a trio, but this album, and by this, Richie Edwards undeniably fundamentally cemented their credibility, weight, and overall provided the foundation what they could build their later success upon. Before the Holy Bible, Nicky Wire and Richie Edwards shared the writing credits 50-50, but this time Richie wrote 85% of the lyrics. At this point it was almost irrelevant that he couldn't play guitar properly. The rumor was that he was rarely plugged in and didn't play a single note on the album. And although because of this in the last few months he questioned his own self-worth in the band, it actually added to his appeal. This giving him yet another iconic layer while delivering his final testament through the album's lyrics. They originally promised a glorious self-destruction with their first album, Generation Terrorists, but it seemed that instead of an early demise, the Holy Bible was really it. It didn't matter that the album didn't do well in the charts back then, but it became the ultimate classic, the Dirty Manix album, a reference point to whatever they did later. Richie Edwards' disappearance has been discussed and analyzed endlessly. I believe that the best book that truly examines the circumstances and the possible outcomes is Vidron Traces by Sarah Havis Roberts and Leon Noakes, written together with Richie's sister Rachel Edwards. There are some shocking details come to surface in this book. It seems that things were really off within the band during the last months. After the commercial failure of the Holy Bible, the band was on the brink of being dropped by the record company, hence they were already changing direction musically, in which Richie didn't really fit in. And being the architect of the band, the one who single-handedly engineered the Manic's early success, their rise to fame, this must have been utterly humiliating. It must have made him feel like an outcast, sensing that his presence meant a compromise for the future. There's an interesting quote here from James Dean Bradfield. One thing I know is that towards the end, Richie became very obsessed with some kind of victory over himself. He really didn't want to be a loser. But because we haven't got a clue what happened to him, people can't take that as a testament in blood that he failed or he succeeded. All I know is that, as I say, towards the end, he was totally obsessed with this idea of victory. What sort of victory we will most probably never know. Nothing was a coincidence with Richie Edwards. He carefully planned the Manic Street Preacher's rise to fame by obsessively keeping files on London journalists and anticipating the band's every step towards fame. Was his disappearance an act of trying to regain intellectual control over what he was losing? A will to overshadow it all with a statement that's much bigger than a medium of rock music, like the music industry? 
disappearances captivate our imaginations endlessly and Richie knew this very well. From Jim Thompson to Lord Lucan, we are fascinated by the mystery of it all. The current form of rock music, which seems so important now, will be long irrelevant when people will still talk about this story, this modern day poet who went missing. Allow me a personal observation here, something subjective as I saw this show live back then. This might seem very insignificant, but it stuck with me ever since. Since every single thing, every choice he made was some sort of a statement with Richie. At the last show, which I was lucky to witness, he wore the sleeveless Nike hoodie with the brand's well-known slogan, Just Do It. Although it seems very likely that he purchased a piece of clothing just to show off his new tattoos, as he even showed them off in a taxi to fans leaving a gig. But if it's a coincidence, and this is my personal opinion, the message was still odd just one month before the disappearance at the time. Just do it. Just do what exactly? The tattoos he got during the last months were also noteworthy and significant. One of them on his left upper arm depicted the ninth circle of hell from Dante's Inferno, the circle of treachery. Described as the bottom of the universe that houses the betrayers of family and community, was this a sign that he was getting ready to leave everything behind? The Last Boy, the first volume of my Noah and comic book series, commemorates my late idol, who with his incredible wit and intelligence and his determined full-on decadence shaped me as a young man. I portrayed him as I saw him live in his grey sleeveless hoodie. This is a respectful personal tribute to a lost youth, a lost life. However, if I'm being honest, I wouldn't recommend the graphic novel to Manix fans, maybe not even to Richie fans. It sides with the book with John Tracy's, attempts to finally detach Richie Edwards from the band, placing him in this magical otherworldly realm. He meets my main character, Noan, who is a guide between life and death from other stories like The Scorched Village and Epiphany, and they embark on a journey together where he meets demons, reflections, visions from this world. He's kind of an obscured version of the real person. His name is different, like Blake in Gus Van Sant's film about Kurt Cobain, The Last Days. And while we at Kurt Cobain, it's nothing like the comic book Godspeed. The Astoria Theatre building, which once stood at the end of Tottenham Court Road, has been demolished. The ticket which I still keep has faded, but Richie Edwards' memory will remain. So much time has passed since I saw this gig when I started to draw The Lost Boy in 2021. It seemed that no one cared about this story anymore. But the deeper I went, I saw how much interest there still is, with entire sites, pages, communities exclusively dedicated to this great man who quite simply sacrificed his life for his art, which is incredibly rare these days. 